Today's a little bit different because we're kind of covering a larger portion of Scripture. And if you're visiting with us today, uh, what we tend to do at this church is we go through just the Bible. We're going to preach the Bible here. Um, there's nothing wrong with topical preaching, and from, from time to time I'll do some topical preaching. But for the most part, what we like to do is grab a book of the Bible and work our way through it. Uh, and we tend to go Old Testament, New Testament, Old Testament, New Testament, and we're in the middle of 1 Samuel right now. And so I would invite you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 14. We're going to begin with, chat, with verse 24, and we're going to go all the way through the entire chapter of 1 Samuel 15. So most of the time, we'll actually read every word of the passage, but because we're covering a large portion of Scripture today, it's going to be a little bit more of a paraphrase, which is why we won't have necessarily an elder come up and read the entire passage uh, in its entirety. With that said... Uh, I strongly encourage you guys, if you haven't already, we try to send these emails out uh, in advance uh, to let you know, let me silence my phone real quick, <laughs> um, feel free to do likewise, by the way, uh, but let me, uh, let me just encourage you, we, we try to send these emails out to anybody who's listed on our registry um, and, uh, that let you know where we're going where we're going to be in the following week. So if you, if you get a chance to read those, do follow along. Do try to, to jump into the scripture so that when you come in on Sunday, you know, it's familiar to you. And, and I think that's helpful. But if you didn't, if you didn't get them, just read this passage of scripture at some point today. Um, it's going to help you understand the fullness of what's going on because we won't be able to touch on every single thing. But there's a, a tremendous theme that runs pretty much from 1424 through chapter 15, which is why we're taking it in larger chunks. And just to give you a way of recap, where we were last week is one of my, I love, there's so many wonderful stories and accounts in the book of 1 Samuel that depict these amazing heroic acts of faith, just incredible accounts. And last week is one of my favorites. It's this little known hero by the name of Jonathan. I mean, most people know who Jonathan is, but I kind of feel like, my goodness, he's so David-like in everything that he does and the way he lives his life and the type of heart he has. And later in 1 Samuel, it's actually going to say that God knit Jonathan's heart together with David's heart. Like these two guys were like one in the same. And, and while Saul was up on a hill watching an army of 35,000 Philistines gather with all of their chariots and their horsemen and, and an unknown number of people who are footmen and they just don't know how many. It's a huge army. Saul's up on a hill and he's doing everything he can to keep his army from running away while Saul is cowering and manipulating circumstances to hang on to what few men he has. His son Jonathan is by himself with his armor bearer, so the two of them. They're down in a valley hidden from both sides. Nobody knows where they are. And Jonathan does in private what his father Saul should have done in public. And Jonathan looks up at the army and he sees them all by himself and he's saying, it might be. It's not even I know. It's an it might be that the Lord will work for us today. Let's go up there. because, And then he says his point, his whole reasoning for saying such a it might be kind of mentality. It feels like a rash decision, which we're going to talk about Saul's rash decision today. But it seems almost rash. He's like, okay, there's 35,000 people on the other side of that hill, all armed with horses and chariots and swords, and I'm the only one in my division that has a sword, and we're going to do it anyway because who knows? Maybe God will do it. And then he says his reasoning is because nothing nothing will prevent the Lord from saving by many or by few. And he's thinking back to the, to the lessons of Gideon that Samuel had reminded them of on his, on his father's coronation day. And he's remembering that, that Gideon had an army of, of 32,000 that was reduced down to 300 people. And God won the day, again, not with weapons of war, but with weapons of worship. And he's thinking back, Jonathan's thinking back to that. And he's saying, if God did it with 300, he can do it with me and my armor bearer. He can do it again. Because nothing, nothing, nothing will prevent my Lord from saving by many or by few. And yet Jonathan still was like, I still don't know how this is going to play out. The Lord will save us. Maybe he'll save us today as I take the hill. Or maybe he'll save us in 100 years. But he's going to do it. And my life, I want it to be about who he is, his character, no matter what happens next. And so Jonathan takes the hill, and the army is, is routed, and then God joins the battle. Jonathan and his armor bearer, they're taking out 20 guys, it says, in the span of half an acre, and then God starts doing his thing, and the Philistines, they begin to fight each other. God tends to use that tactic. He gets the enemy to fight itself. And so there they are. They're up on the hill. They're fighting themselves. Saul's on the other side. He doesn't know what's going on. He's there with his 600 guys, and he's just around the Ark of the Covenant. 
And he's trying to like get the priests to get things ready. And he hears some noise on the other side of the hill. And he sees that the Philistines are starting to fight themselves. And there's this great uproar in his camp. And he's like, well, uh, okay, uh, somebody else is getting my glory. And he stops the priests and he grabs his army and he runs over to the hill. And I don't think it's because he was trying to look religious with the ark. And if we read this passage, that's what you're going to see is he's, he's getting priests around the ark. But as soon as he hears the noise at the Philistine camp, he stops that and he runs to take the battle. And I don't think he's running to back his son up. I think he's running because he's thinking, my son is stealing my glory. I'm supposed to be the guy winning the day. This isn't cool. I've got to get over there. I've got to be a part of the victory before the victory is assured. They have to be chanting my name. And as we keep going through 1 Samuel, this is a common theme in Saul's life. So while Jonathan is fighting this war, at the same time, Samuel, or excuse me, Saul, I keep choking over those names, so bear with me here, church. There's a lot of S's in this. That we're going to have Samuel, then we're going to have Saul, then we're going to have Solomon. There's a lot of that, so bear with me. So you got Saul up on the hill, and, and he's, he's now, he's trying to manipulate events while Jonathan is inspiring because of his faith. And so we're going to cover the rest of this chapter in its entirety, but we're going to kind of take it from a much higher view than we're used to. And, and again, uh, please read when you go back home. So it begins here in verse 24. And what we see is that while Jonathan's out there following after the Lord, living out his faith, we see that Saul has made a rash It says, verse 24, and the men of Israel were distressed in that day for Saul had, past tense, had, he's already done this, he placed an oath under the people saying, cursed is the man who eats any food until evening before I have taken vengeance on my enemies. So none of the people tasted food, which is crazy, right? You, you think of this and you think of a general and you're like, okay, you've got a big fight coming. You're severely outnumbered. What do you want to do? Starve your men, right? Like let's, let's go fight as tired and hungry as we possibly can. And we hear this decision and we think, this is crazy, right? This doesn't make any sense. And yet Saul, it's all manipulation. He's sitting here and he's trying to rally his men. The only thing I can wrap my brain around in this, and I've done a couple of studies on why would he make this silly, stupid oath that would actually hinder him in the battle to come. And I think he's seeing the victory starting to come. He's seen this before. He's seen the Lord fight the battles for him. And he's seeing the Philistines fight themselves. And maybe he's just trying to rally what's left of his 600 guys. And he's saying, you know what? This is not going to take long, okay? You, don't eat, you know what? Nobody even eats because we're going to beat him before we even get hungry. Maybe that's what he's trying to say. I don't know. It doesn't really elaborate on this. It's the only thing that makes sense to me. But again, it's just a manipulation. He's trying to get his guys psyched up for the battle. That's one option. And so Jonathan, though, at the same time, Jonathan's also making rash decisions, right? I mean, it feels kind of rash. He's out there by himself. He's between both camps. He's hidden from both armies. He could run and hide just like everybody else did. And Jonathan looks up at the hill and goes, yeah, you know what? Let's do it. Let's, let's, let's fight the battle. So there's two rash decisions going on here. Jonathan's like, he's putting his rash decision towards fighting the enemy, and Jonathan's putting his rash decision on manipulating his own army. But Jonathan's rash decision is not based in himself. It's based in his knowledge of the character of God. Jonathan is looking at God saying, I know who my God is. I know what my God has, pr has promised. And I believe even if I die today, nothing will prevent him from saving by many or by few. And there's a type of rash decision that we can make because we are confident in who our Savior is. And some of us will overthink something to death before taking a single step because we're not actually confident that God will do the things he said he will do or that he is the person he says he is. So that's just a quick little warning for us. But the passage continues. Jonathan wins the day, right? And, and if, we, if you were here last week, you heard, he takes out 20 guys in a half an acre. He's winning. He crests the hill. He sees the army and he's like, I just took out 20. There's 35,000 to go. <sighs> All right. Let's just keep going. And, and, but while he's doing this, the Lord is engaging in battle. The Philistines are fighting one another. Jonathan is, is saying, it's happening again. That story about Gideon that Samuel reminded us of. It's happening right now. Guys, come on. And then it says that all the people who were hiding, the ones who ran away, they came out of hiding and they pursued the enemy. And again, if you were here a few weeks ago, the lesson there is that even if you're scared, even though that's not what God wants for you, the Lord will, will still lead from the front. If you will watch what he's doing and follow suit and believe that he can and will desire to deliver you and save you and keep you, then he's not going to hold your fear against you. He's going to deliver it from you, you, you from it. 
And so he invites those who were hiding into the victory, as he so often does when he engages with enemies. He invites his people into the victory that he himself, God himself, is winning. Not Jonathan. Jonathan only got 20. God took out 35,000. And he invites his children into the victory, into the pursuit. And while they're pursuing, they have a lull in the battle and something happens. And, and Jonathan, he's, he, does, he wasn't there. Remember when Saul made this rash oath of don't eat. And so Jonathan walks out. He's got his staff in hand. And he sees it. This whole thing is incredibly just not um, uh, sanitary. Really gross. So he's walking with his staff. He looks down. He sees a, a honeycomb just laying there on the floor. And he's like, oh, and he sticks his staff into the honeycomb. He picks it up, licks his honey off the staff, and he's like, wow, that's some good honey. The army looks at him and goes, what are you doing? Did you not hear your dad? And I kind of think, like, Jonathan's probably sitting there going, no, I did not hear my dad. I was too busy killing 20 guys in half an acre. What were you doing? You know, and, like, so he's, he's probably like, I had no idea that this was going on. And Jonathan does something that any father is very aware of. He talks back about his dad publicly in front of other guys. And so he's, he's sitting here and he's pointing out. Now, Jonathan's not wrong here, but this is a, not a good move on his part. Jonathan eats the honey, finds out that his dad said nobody's supposed to eat. And then Jonathan does this. Can't you just picture like a, like a teenager, right? My father has troubled the land. Look how, many, look how my countenance has brightened because I tasted just a little bit of honey. This is verse 29, verse 30. How much better if people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies, which they found? For now, would there not have been a much greater slaughter among the Philistines? So here's Jonathan, the prince, young man. Saul's young at this time. Jonathan, we don't know. He's probably, he could be a teenager. He could be early 20s. We're not really sure, but he's young. And he just won the day, right? He proved through faith that God is still trustworthy. And then he hears this law that his dad says. And rather than keep it to himself. He's, he then tells the army, hey, that was a really stupid rule my dad just gave. That, that's dumb. I mean, look, we could have won the whole thing if everybody wasn't hungry, right? And so that's Jonathan. Now, he's not wrong, but this is going to get him in trouble. And so things get even worse. Okay, so remember, what is, the, what is the oath that Saul put them under? Don't eat anything until victory. And if you keep following the passage, what you're going to see is in, in verse uh, 31 and that, those following passages, uh, they come to this spot, and, and the, the men of Israel are so tired, and they're so hungry, and yet they're still chasing the enemy. And what do they do? They come to this border town in Israel, and they defeat again the Philistines. But this time there's plunder. There's animals that the Philistines had, and they just go bonkers on these animals. They just start killing them, butchering them, eating them, what it seems to be raw. Like they're just eating meat. They're, they're eating meat with the blood still in it. And if you've followed through with your Bible, if you've read this ever before, there's, there's laws in the Mosaic Covenant that Moses had written that says, don't do that. Do not eat meat with the blood still in it for the life is in the blood. God said that to Moses. Moses gave that to the people. And so there's all these Israelites in the army breaking Saul's oath and eating like crazy. And not only are they eating, but they're sinning in their eating. They're, they're eating blood which they're not supposed to do as the chosen people of Israel. Make no mistake, and this will change your perspective of the following verses. Pay attention to this, church. This is a very public and a very corporate communal act of sin. They are all disobeying the command of Saul in this moment. They are all sinning by eating the blood. And it, if you keep reading, what you see is that Saul is like, oh my gosh, I've got I've to build an altar. Uh, We've got to cover this sin. And he starts to build this altar. He starts to cook the meat. And it says that he's trying to prevent them from sinning. They've already sinned. He's trying to prevent more sin. But at no point in that part of today's passage does Saul call for anyone's death. Nobody, he thinks, in the midst of all of this very public, very, very uh, communal sin does he say anyone should die? But all of that changes in the following paragraph. All of it switches. And I think what we see here is we begin to see the true heart of Saul. And this is my warning to you, church. This is what I hope you get out of today's message because there's really no heroes in today's passage. This is the proof of what happens when we forget how the Lord has saved us how the Lord is a rescuer, how the Lord is holy, how the Lord is good, how the Lord has called us. When we forget those things and we try to make ourselves the rescuer, the deliverer, the savior, when we shift our, our love, our loyalty, our adoration, our worship from God to self, this is the result. And so Saul, 
Saul looks past the very corporate, the very public sin, and he drops his son's name. And I think he does this intentionally. Remember, what was the, what was the oath that Saul gave? Don't eat anything. What was it that his army did? They ate everything. <laughs> like They ate live animals, blood and all. And he doesn't call for their deaths. But then in verse 37, Saul asks God something. Finally, Saul is asking God something. Hasn't happened yet. So he goes, verse 37, so Saul asked the counsel of God and he asks, shall I go down after the Philistines? Will you deliver them into the hand of Israel? In other words, Saul's saying, hey, if I keep pursuing, will we win? And it says, but he, God, did not answer him, Saul, that day. Verse 38, and Saul said, come over here, all the chiefs of the people, and know and see what the sin was today. And I'm kind of wondering from the eyes, from the mindset of all of the, the chiefs of the people who were there and witnessing everything that just transpired, this very corporate, very public sinning of the army as they are gorging themselves on the meat and the blood, as they kind of like timidly coming up going like, do, do you mean that sin? You know, the one that's still going on with the people there and the, and the, and the killing of the animals and, and, and them eating the food and the flesh of all the stuff that you told them not to, that one, the, the really public one? And, John, and, and Saul's saying, no, 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 not that. There's something else. I want to point towards something else. And then he drops his son's name. It says, for, verse 39, for the Lord lives, for as the Lord lives who saves Israel, though it be Jonathan, my son, he shall surely die. But not a man among all the people answered him. Part of me wonders, are they nervous? He's saying, well, man, if you're going to hold us accountable, then the whole army is going to die because we were all doing this just seconds ago. But for some reason, Saul intentionally puts Jonathan's name out there in the public for them to consider. Nobody says a word. Because Jonathan's the hero. And they don't want to draw attention back to themselves. And then verse 40, he says, then he says to all Israel, this is Saul, you be on one side, my son Jonathan and I will be on the other side. And the people said to Saul, yeah, do what seems good to you. And therefore Saul said to the Lord, the God of Israel, give a perfect lot. Now, if, you, if you're following along, we already know God's not talking to Saul right now. So I think this is all for show. And so Saul and Jonathan were taken, but the people escaped. You see what just happened? Watch this. This is, again, this is very revealing of Saul. And, and again, church, I think we are far more inclined to think and feel and believe like Saul than we are like David or Jonathan or anyone else. This is our natural bend. Saul just took his son Jonathan, who had, in this moment, if he just cast general lots, he had a one, and let's just say it's still the really small army. He's got a one in 600 chance of surviving. Saul just, just divided everybody and made it 50-50. He said, okay, it's either one of these 600. Again, it's probably more than six at this point because the, the scared people came back to fight, but we're going to just keep it at six. So it's either one of these 600 or it's Jonathan and myself. So he just turned it to a flip of the coin. And then it became Jonathan and himself. Now what man is going to kill their king when the king puts it out there for him to do that? So let's keep going. It says, this just feels so intentional to me. Verse 42, and Saul says, cast lots between Jonathan and me. And so Jonathan was taken. And Saul said to Jonathan, tell me what you have done. And Jonathan said to him, I only tasted a little honey with the end of my rod that was in my hand. So now I have to die? And Saul answered, God, do so and more also, for you shall surely die, Jonathan. My goodness, the way this unfolds, it seems intentional. And also, look how religious Saul sounds in the midst of this. There's a lot of, may the Lord do this, or may the Lord do that, and, and, and there's sin involved that we have to purge. And yet, he looks past the public corporate sin of his army and points out the private and, and, and not actual eating of the blood kind of sin of his son. And I don't think it's because his son actually sinned that he's doing anything. Like, let's compare all this again. Saul remained on his protected hill, trembling while Jonathan was out there, believing that nothing can prevent the Lord from saving by many or by few. Saul is up there religiously prepping the Ark of the Covenant to do what he believes is the religious requirement to lead it into battle, while Jonathan is up there living out his faith and taking the hill. Saul is cowering while Jonathan is inspiring people to fight. Saul is rashly making foolish oaths while Jonathan is pointing out those foolish oaths to the army. 
Jonathan's become a problem for Saul. Jonathan is going to walk away from this, and he's going to be the one that people are going to say, Jonathan won the day. And Saul's looking at this, and we will see this in Saul over and over and over again. Saul's looking at his own son being like, that should have been me. Greed, pride, jealousy, these are things that always lead to death. Always. Oh, be careful, church, because that is what we are inclined to move toward. Thank goodness for Jesus. Thank goodness for the Holy Spirit who allows us to walk the way Jesus walks. Resist the enemy. He will flee from you. Press into Jesus, and this does not have to be our story. This is what happens when we don't remember the character of God, when we forget that God saved us because we actually needed saving. Then we try to become our own saviors, and we can't do it, church. We can't hold that weight. We can't carry that. When we forget that God brought us the victory over our fears, then we will begin to try and manipulate everything around us to, to get out of our fears. And before we're even aware of where we've come from or how far we've slidden, we might even try to manipulate our own family to try and make our own situation seem just a little bit better, a little bit more secure, and yet it's all a lie. Because only in Christ, only in the Lord is there security. Only in Christ is there genuine, true, lasting victory. And so Jonathan is basically said, we're going to kill you. His own father is saying, I'm going to kill you. And I think this is the moment when, when Saul realized, I'm the king. I'm supposed to have the glory. And maybe the easiest way to get rid of uh, an obstacle is to simply kill it, even if it's my own son. I think this is the beginnings of that mindset inside of Saul. But never forget that our God is a rescuer. Jonathan never forgot that. In verse 45, excuse me, 40, 45, he says, the people said to Saul, this is the people. Shall Jonathan die who's accomplished this great deliverance in Israel? Certainly not. As the Lord lives, not one hair on his head shall fall to the ground. For watch this verbiage, church. He has worked with God this day. So the people rescued Jonathan, and he did not die. And then Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, and the Philistines went their own way. Church, God, uh, Jonathan inspired a nation back to trusting in God that day because he had a faith that said it might be that the Lord will work for us because nothing will prevent the Lord from saving by many or by few. And because he walked like that, and he lived his faith out before man, God fought the battle for them and invited them into the victory. And they were victorious. And the army, the army are the ones that said, Jonathan worked with God. Jonathan inspired revival because of his faithful walk. And Saul spends the rest of this chapter 14 and probably, well, really, truly, the rest of his life striving, striving so hard to try and gain the glory that his son won in this one battle. And then later, he'll try to strive even harder to try and gain the glory that's being given to David instead of to himself. He will kill people because of this. He will fight people because he wants his name sung. And other people's names keep getting sung. And he keeps looking at his own life. And I, again, church, we are far more like Saul, I think, than David. Because how many of us watch as other people do the right thing and then we sit back and just beat ourselves up and think, that should have been me. But still don't take the next step. Oh, take the steps, but take them towards Jesus and let him move you and lead you. He spends the rest of his life striving. It says in verse 47, so Saul established his sovereignty over Israel. Still focused on Saul. And he fought against all of his enemies on every side, against Moab, against the people of Ammon, against Edom, against the kings of Zobah, and against the Philistines. And wherever he turned, he, Saul, harassed them. Doesn't that sound exhausting, church? I think he's doing it because he feels like he has to, not because he's trying to be obedient to the Lord. He's trying to win more glory. He's trying to get what he didn't do at this first battle, I think. Verse 52, now there was a fierce war with the Philistines all the days of Saul. And when Saul saw any strong man or any valiant man, he took him for himself. He's always trying to manipulate the circumstances to increase the possibility that he will win the next fight but he's never dependent on the Lord to win the battle. And so we move into verse 15. 
But before we do that, I just want to close out the idea of the, the comparison between Saul and Jonathan. And then we're going to cover 15 fairly quickly here. A lot happens, but it's, it's all in the same vein of thought. Think about this. Saul was just ready to kill his own son. He was ready to take him out. I think because he realized his son was now a threat. That his son Jonathan was stealing glory that he himself wanted. Church, when you pursue the Lord with your whole heart and you walk your faith out publicly, when you press through the fears that the enemy will try to use to block you from doing the will of the Lord and you press through that instead and walk in obedience to what the Lord is calling you to do, you can be positive that two things are going to happen. The first one is that you're going to encounter opposition. And sometimes it's tremendous opposition. Oftentimes it's opposition from people that you least expect it from. In this case, it's his own father willing to kill him. All Jonathan did was trust in the Lord. All Jonathan did was believe that the character that he came to know about God is truly God's character. That nothing will stop the Lord from saving by many or by few. And yet now his father wants to kill him. So you're going to encounter opposition when you begin to live out your faith boldly. But you're also going to see another thing. The Lord will use you. The Lord will use you to bring other people into right relationship with him because that's what he desires to use his children for. That's why we are called the body of Christ. He wants his church to be so surrendered to him that he can say, that person in Harvest Food needs to hear the gospel speak up. Right? Right? And when we do these things, you will begin to influence other people. When you do that, church, do not get a big head because it's got nothing to do with you. It's only the Lord. In this case, Jonathan got 20 guys. That's worthy of an applause, right? He did, he did an incredible thing, but it was the Lord who confused the army and defeated 35,000. Jonathan can't stand there and say, I did that. Jonathan can only point to the work of the Lord and say, the Lord did that. Saul is constantly trying to get that praise. So as we continue in the verse, the chapter 15, what we see is that Saul continues to strive. All his life, he will strive to try and gain glory for himself. All his life. 15 verse 1. Now this is fascinating, church. I mean, I only, honestly, this one hit me last night as I was thinking through the day's sermon. Samuel also said to Saul, Listen to these words. Listen to what he's trying to do. The Lord sent me to anoint you, king, over all of his people, over Israel. Let's stop there for just a second and realize what just happened. Saul is really fumbling it. He's fumbling everything. He's trusting in his own self-worth. He's trusting in his own uh, glory. He wants his own name sung. And Samuel comes to him. Now, there's no judgment in Samuel's phrasing right here. What Samuel is doing is reminding Saul who he is. He's sitting there saying, don't forget. Don't forget that the Lord sent me to anoint you. You were not a mistake. God wants you to succeed. He's saying, Saul, I picked you out of everybody in Israel. And we're going to see this even more in just a moment. Out of everybody in Israel, I chose you, Saul. You can do this because I'm the one who picked you. And so Samuel is reminding Saul, he's trying to get it through his head one more time. Don't forget that the Lord is the one who is directing your steps. Don't forget that. If you forget that, then you're going to go down a path that the Lord will allow you to go down, but he's not going to follow. And so he gives him a command. He says, remember who you are. Remember who God said you are. Remember the one who called you. And then he says, now, therefore, heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I, God, will punish Amalek, which is the Amalekites, it's a people group, for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them. Now, let me just back this up a little bit because, you know, you may be asking, who, who is this guy and why is it so bad? Um, the Amalekites were, let me just briefly say, when, when Israel was freed from Egypt back in the book of Exodus, they come out of Exodus, they, they have this tremendous showdown with, with the Egyptian army, and, and God parts the Red Sea. And we've all probably heard that story, even if you don't read your Bible, that one's been made into movies and all this stuff. And they go through the Red Sea, and then the Israelite army comes in behind them, and God closes the waters. They win the day. It's awesome. 
They get to the other side. They're singing songs of praise. They're free, right? And then the Amalekites show up and they ambush them. And they have their first real battle. They have their first real war as a nation. And as they're fighting this war, Moses realizes that the Lord is saying, hey, as long as your hands are high and you're giving praise to me, you'll be victorious. But if your arms fall, then the enemy's going to overcome. And so they, they have elders like propping Moses up and keeping his hands in the air and they win the day. It's, it's like one paragraph in, in uh, Exodus. And they win the day and then God makes this promise. He says this to Moses in Exodus 17, 14. He says, write this for a memorial. Don't forget. Seems to be a theme in today's passage. Don't forget. Write this in a memorial in the book recounted in the hearing of Joshua that I, God, will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. In other words, this is a promise God made to his children hundreds of years ago. And we can't forget, church, that the Lord will always keep his promises. And in this case, he's actually asking Saul to fulfill this promise. It's hundreds of years old. And he's saying, now is the time. The Amalekites have to go, and, and this could become a much, much longer sermon as we talk about why that's the case, and maybe we'll talk about it someday, but not today. So we're going to move into this, because Saul actually gets a much bigger army this time. He grabs 200,000 people instead of his little 3,000 that he tried for his first border scrimmage. He gets 200,000, and he wins, and he wins big, and he takes out everybody. He says he utterly destroys the nation almost, almost. Right? Instead, it says this, verse 9, but Saul and the people spared Agag, that's their king, and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good. And they were unwilling to utterly destroy them. But everything despised and worthless, that they utterly destroyed. That's so important because it says Saul was unwilling to destroy the things that he perceived as good, even though God had already told him they're evil. Now, we may not fully understand how this whole thing works with animals and such, but these animals were being used for evil purposes, and God was saying they're evil. They have to be completely wiped out. You've got to get rid of the evil in your life. And how often do we as Christians sit here and say, Lord, I love you so much. I want to give you my whole heart. I love you. I'm going to give you everything that I have except for this stuff over here that doesn't look as evil as the rest. And I really enjoy this part. But this stuff over here that looks really evil, of course I'm going to get rid of that. Like, yeah, this is the obvious stuff. I'm going to get rid of this. But this stuff, you know, it's not expressly said that this is evil. I really enjoy it. I'm going to keep it in my life, even though I know that in the back of my head, this is stealing me from the Lord. God's called it evil, but it looks good to me. I'm going to hang on to it. And I'm even going to use religion to try and explain why I should hang on to it and keep it, because that's what Saul does. Oh, there's so many lessons for us here today, church. How often as we as Christians do that? Verse 12, it says, so, so when Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul... It was told to Samuel by saying, Saul went to Carmel. And indeed, he set up a monument for himself. See, this is the outcome. Again, when we forget that we have a Savior who has saved us, when we forget the saving power and the history of Jesus in our lives, we have a tendency to try and make ourselves our own Jesus, our own God. Saul is building monuments not to God, but to himself. And remember who's writing this, Samuel. Samuel, he was a judge. He fought wars. He fought battles. He built monuments too. But all of his monuments were designed to point people back to heaven and remind them of the deliverance that the Lord had given them that day. Saul, he's building monuments to himself because he's hanging on to these good things that the Lord told him, you got to get rid of all of it. I want your whole heart. And Saul proves his self-idolatry in a really common way. I mean, this stuff comes almost right out of a child psychology handbook. This is really obvious stuff. And, and, and look at what happens over the next several verses. Verse, for, for, excuse me, verse 13, Samuel comes walking up to Saul. Saul comes running out to Samuel very publicly, very loudly. He goes, blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. So in view of everybody, he runs out, he goes to the priest, and he's like, hey, look at this cool religious thing. I'm with this guy. I have done the work of the Lord. But look at where his focus is. He's, I have performed for you. Everything is pointing back at Saul. Nothing is pointing at the Lord. And then forget the fact that it's really obvious to Samuel that he has not fulfilled the promise of the Lord. He can hear all the animals that were supposed to be destroyed. Saul says in verse 14 and 15, what then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears and lowing of the oxen that I hear? And Saul says, well, they, they have brought them from the Amalekites. 
How often do we do this? How often do our kids do this? So common. I did the good thing. If there's bad stuff, that was someone else. Not my fault. I did the good stuff. Focus on me. I did the good stuff. Bad stuff, somebody else, right? And he does this all throughout this passage. Continuing in verse 15. For the people, the people spared the best of the sheep. These are his people. He's throwing them under the bus. The people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen. Then he tries to throw a religious spin on it. And he says, oh, to sacrifice to the Lord, your God. And the rest, we have utterly destroyed. He always puts himself in with what God desired them to do. And he always puts the people in every time he's trying to point out, we didn't do it. Church, be leery. Excuse me. Anytime there's something good to be said, Saul is always including himself. And anytime there's something bad, he deflects it to other people. Church, be really leery of leaders who only ever tell you the good things about themselves and are never willing to talk about the struggles they have in their own lives. We are all the same. There's nothing special about anybody. And if you look to leaders to be that moral example for you, I mean, hopefully, hopefully, right? I am, str- I am trying to do that because I am following after the Lord as much as I can with my whole heart, but I'm human too, right? Jesus is the sinless one. And we are all in a process of sanctification and you're never gonna be able to find true, genuine religious transformation or genuine heart transformation by voting for the right politician or by getting the right leader. You're gonna find it as Jesus becomes more alive in you and you reveal that to the society around you. You're never gonna be able to vote that in. Okay? I know we're in a political season. That's all I'm gonna say about that. (laughs) So... Saul says, I did the good things. The, bad, the, the people did the bad things. So be leery of leaders that are, are never willing to discuss their, their failings, their faults. Doesn't mean God can't use them. But they're going to disappoint you. So Samuel then gives Saul one opportunity. And this is massive, church. If you, if you leave with nothing else, leave with these, these closing statements that, Samuel, or excuse me, that Saul has in response to Samuel. Because we can look at Saul and we always have a tendency to look at Saul and be like, he's obviously the bad guy. Right? From the very beginning, we know it's going to be Saul versus David, and David wins. And so, so Saul, we look at, and we just, we just throw him out because he's the bad guy. We're way more like Saul than we are like David, so we can learn from him. And Saul is given chance after chance after chance. Samuel had just reminded him again that God was the one who called him. God is the one who is equipping him. Go and do the things that God has called you to do. You have the the strength from him, not within yourself, but his strength. If you go in his strength, you're going to be victorious. Don't forget Saul. That's what Samuel was trying to say to him before he committed this sin. And now he gives him one more chance for repentance. Verse 16, Samuel says to Saul, be quiet, exclamation point in New King James Version. This is a serious moment here. He says, be quiet and I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night. This is specific, right? And Saul says to him, "Uh, speak on. Verse 17, so Samuel said, when you were little, in your own eyes, were you not the head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? In other words, church, Samuel is reminding Saul, God knows you. Not only does he know you, he saw your heart, he saw your dreams, he saw all the things that you wanted, and not only did he see them, he gave them to you. You have been given every single thing you ever sought, Saul. Don't you realize how much God loves you, how much God is for you, how much he has invested in you as the king of the nation? You're not a mistake, Saul. Don't give up. And then he gives him this chance, one more chance. He says, now the Lord sent you on a mission. And he said, go, utterly destroy the sinners. That the, of the Amalekites and fight against them until they are consumed. And when they did not, excuse me, and when then you, Saul, did not obey the voice of the Lord. Why did you not obey the voice of the Lord? And then he clarifies how Saul has not obeyed the voice of the Lord. He says, why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? Samuel's saying, why did you allow greed and ego and and pride, why did you let that rule your heart instead of God? He's qualifying it. And then he waits for a response. But Saul can't get out of his own way. It's too late for him. Saul has made himself his own God. And Saul responds once again. Verse 20, he says, but I have obeyed. 
You can't even see it anymore, church. You can't see a world where he's not the hero. It's beyond his comprehension. He's his own God now. And then Saul says in verse 20 through 21, I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites, but the people, they took the plunder. Doesn't this just sound like the Garden of Eden, Eden, right? Like, you know, he's talking to Adam. and He's like, Adam, what happened? He's like, oh, the woman gave me the apple. And then he asked the woman, hey, what what happened? Well, uh, the serpent tricked me. It's always, always passing the buck. This is just what we do as humans. Apart from Christ, this is what we do. Oh, thank God for Christ. Saul had very publicly decided to pursue greed instead of obedience, and now he's trying to cover it up with religion. He's trying to make it look like he's godly. And what's more, I don't even think he knows what the problem really is anymore. This is what happens when we forget. Saul, Saul thought looking religious would be good enough to keep his name pure in the eyes of the people, which is why he's coming out to Samuel saying, oh, man of God, oh, We've done what, the, what you've asked. We've followed the command of the Lord. Saul's looking for Samuel to give him accolades. He's, he's looking for him to, to back up his actions, and, Saul, and Samuel will not do it. And, and, and really, this is important, church. Who doesn't love an accolade, right? We all want to be told that we're doing a good job. Even, even I, I, I would love to know when a sermon has actually touched somebody because I never know, right? Like, you never really know. And it's, it's encouraging to hear. And yet, as a pastor, you're always like, ooh. I feel bad when people put their attention on me because it's supposed to be on him. So there's this weird catch-22 where you crave it, but you also don't want it. And, and it's, but we all desire for somebody to tell us that, that we have done something that means something, right? Encouragement, when we look in the New Testament, we actually see that encouragement is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Encouragement is a very good, a very godly thing, which makes all the sense in the world why our enemy, the devil, would then try to counterfeit it. And so what is happening is Saul is looking for the counterfeit. Encouragement always draws us back to who we are in Jesus Christ. We're valued by Christ, by God. He loves us. He empowers us. He walks us through. He's our source. He's our security. That's what encouragement does. But vain ego boosting puts us in the place of Jesus. And that's what Saul's looking for. And we can see this in his false repentance. Again, the most important verse we can take away from the lesson of Saul today is this, in verse 22. If you're a highlighter, highlight this. Has the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as the iniquity of idolatry. Because you, Saul, have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you from being king. The Lord was giving Saul one more chance to repent, and Saul was not going to take it. Samuel is saying to Saul, hey, if the Lord called you to do something and you go and you do the opposite, that's the same thing in his eye as witchcraft. Hey, if the Lord is trying to teach you something and you're stubbornly standing your ground on your own validation, that's the same thing as idolatry because you're worshiping yourself. God is looking for our hearts, church. He's not looking for our religion. He's looking for people to recognize that he loves them that he's a rescuer, that he's a deliverer. And that is why we follow, because we know that he's the way that leads to life everlasting. Not because he's throwing down rules and regulations and rituals that we must perform to gain his favor, but that we have his favor and that this is all just to draw us near to him who has already given us life. So often this was the regular preaching and message of Jesus Christ, that God is invested in our hearts And this rest of this chapter, it plays out like a terrible tragedy. Samuel, he decides that he's going to leave Saul. He's never coming back. Now Saul loses it. Saul is sitting there going, oh, no, 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 no. I need you. I need you. You're you're the public face of the religious side of of my people. If they don't think that the priest is with me, then my name is going to go down. My my public opinion is going to go down. My approval ratings are down. You know, like that kind of stuff. And Saul is freaking out. And it says he he basically throws a tantrum and he grabs Samuel's robe and he's, he's ripping it. And Samuel says, hey, just as you ripped my robe, the Lord has ripped the kingdom from your hands. And, and Samuel is still trying to point out, 
God, just turn and repent. Come back to him. Come back to the Lord. He's always there to save you. And Saul will not do it. And finally, as a last-ditch effort to try and keep Samuel in his life, not God, but Samuel, he says to him, Saul says this, I have sinned, yet, this is in verse 30, and this yet is so important. He says, I've sinned, yet, or but. Honor me now, please, before the elders of my people, before Israel, return with me that I may worship the Lord your God. And so Samuel turned back after Saul, and Saul worshiped the Lord. But listen to that repentance. It's not not true. If he had said, I have sinned, comma, forgive me, this story would have a very different ending because the Lord is quick to forgive those who come genuinely to him. And that's true repentance. I have sinned, hard stopped, end of story. I need you, God. That's the only answer in this scenario. But he says, I have sinned, but yet I have sinned. But even though I've sinned, honor me instead. Honor me publicly. Get before the elders of my people. Give me my honor. I want my honor. I need my name sung. That's his motivation. This is the moment where he chose a different destination for his heart. He has chosen himself. It's all just a show. Repentance isn't going to get right. This repentance doesn't get him in the right standing with God. It's just so that he can get public praise. And so Samuel comes down and he does what Saul would not do and he kills the Amalekite king and he fulfills a promise that the Lord gave Israel hundreds of years before. And then Samuel walks off into the sunset. I don't know if there's a sunset. It just seems poetic. But he walks off into the sunset and Saul never sees him again until some very strange story in 1 Samuel 2, which we won't get to in this series. But it's a fun one. Excuse me. Saul wants him to come back so bad, but Samuel will not. God has rejected Saul because Saul has chosen for himself his own God, which is himself. But don't forget, before God rejected Saul, Saul rejected God. He'd chosen a new God for himself, in himself. Saul's life really is a tragedy. He was given such a great beginning, but he's also the proof of what happens when we forget the character of God. When we forget the way that God has saved us in the past, then we will look to be our own rescuer in the future, and we can't do that. We can't. We can't pull it off, church. We're just simply not strong enough. Absent of Jesus, this is our destination. Praise God that he truly is a rescuer. Praise God that we can have full, complete, total assurance in Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Redeemer, who died to fix even these problems, to burn these things out of us and to draw attention to the sins in our lives that we need to bring before the Lord and simply say, I have sinned, forgive me. And he's provided that opportunity for us in his son, Jesus. He's provided the answer. He himself is the answer. Praise God that he has given us the Holy Spirit, that the Bible says is there to convict the world of sin and to teach us and remind us of all of the things that Jesus taught us. Praise God he's equipped us with his word to help us remember. Praise God he's equipped us with testimonies to share with one another because we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Praise God that he has given us so much equipping to avoid the destination that Saul chose for himself. But be aware, church, we can still choose this destination. Do not forget what the Lord has done for you. Take heed to the words of Samuel when he spoke to Saul on his coronation day. Don't forget the stories of the past and how the Lord saved you. They will, rem- they will be helpful in the trials that come that remind you how strong and powerful he is as a redeemer. Only fear the Lord with your whole heart. Don't fear anything else. He's the only one worth fearing. He's the only one worth adoration and worship and love and awe and splendor. It's just God. Nothing else deserves it. Serve him with your whole heart. It's a much better life. It's one that leads to life, not death. And if we don't do these things, if we forget the Lord, if we try to make ourselves the savior of our own lives, this really is our outcome. He's equipped us, church. 
He's equipped us more than we could possibly know to live a life greater than we could possibly hope for through his son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Do not forget the testimony of the Lord on your own life, but walk with the kind of faith that Jonathan walks with that says nothing, nothing, nothing can prevent the Lord from saving by many or by few. It might be that today he'll work for me, but even if he doesn't, I know my God. I know his character. So let's go take that hill. Those are the kinds of Christians that Jesus can change a nation with. Let's pray.